Welcome to In the Studio. My name is Hamza El Nakhal, and I would like to welcome my guests Nariman Nakhal, Selma Inan, and Sarah uh, Musa. Uh, today we're going to talk about the uh, Egyptian uprising, and uh, of course, there's a lot of things we can hope we can cover most of it. Uh, on uh, January 25th, uh, some students or some youth, Egyptian youth, uh, went to protest a lack of jobs, corruption, and uh, in a few days became millions all over the country. And by February 11, Hosni Mubarak resigned. And I just want to start first with Sarah. Tell me, how did this spark? What sparked this event? I usually attribute it to three different things. The first one was the brutal killing of a blogger in Alexandria over the summer of 2010. Uh, the Egyptian police in Alexandria killed Khaled Said. He was a human rights activist, he was a blogger, he was somebody that was very known in the in the, the active uh, opposition community. And um, when he was killed, there was streets, uh, the streets were filled with protesters. Of course, they were all cracked down on, but it was the first level of an uprising. But it disseminated, disseminated immediately. The second one was in November 2010. Um, in November was the uh, pol par parliamentary election. election. And there were videos that had gone around to showing how corrupt the National Democratic Party was, which is the ruling party of the Hosni Mubarak regime. And it demonstrated that they were filling up ballots and they were just, you know, filling in these ballots for the National Democratic yeah. Party left and right, where the poll doors would be closed and people wouldn't be allowed to vote. And yeah. there was a lot of violence that was incited against anybody who desired to vote. And um, th these videos spread like wildfire. It was extremely corrupt. People were outraged. So there were also some levels of people wanting to collaborate, people wanting to get together and, and, and protest. But of course, those efforts were cracked down on as well. And then the last one was the uh, Tunisian uprising. In um, January, the Tunisian people were able to oust their own president, Ben Ali, and they did so successfully with um, organization, with collaboration, and a youth movement that worked very well together to topple this regime. And the, you know, the Egyptian people said, well, Ben Ali's only been in presidency for 24 years. I mean, it, Mubarak's been there for 30. He's got nothing on us. So we can totally take on Mubarak. So I think those are the three, three major factors that led to this major uh, revolution, of course, coupled with the fact that Mubarak's been there for 30 years. You know, I was really impressed by the civility of the of these youth who went into the Tahrir Square. And uh, they, 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 I mean, they, they completely defenseless, defenseless people, and they went into a struggle against a lot of forces, and the military came in. And uh, could you talk us? to us about the role of the military in the, in yeah. the revolution? Yeah, you know, at, at first it seemed like the military was going to try to stay neutral um, because, you know, you had Mubarak who wasn't going to step down and you had the people who were fearless. I mean, they lost all fear. Yeah. Basically, you know, they had gone to the point where they had nothing to lose anymore. Um, and this was all that they had left to do. And because they have such huge hearts and such courage, you know, they were able to stay and they were able to just be completely courageous and fearless. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the military, I think, played an important role in the beginning when they said that they weren't going to fire on the protesters because mm -hmm. as fearless as you could be, if you're going to be, you know, fired on by ta army tanks, there's yeah, not much yeah. you can do, of course. Yeah. So um, I think, you know, the army allowed the people to to stay there and to, you know, 
even when they were defenseless and even when they were peacefully protesting, no weapons on them, you know, I think the army gave them somewhat of a cover to be able to do that. Can, can, you, can you talk to us about the civility? I mean, I've seen people organizing themselves, even though with, the, with really the, it's, it's uh, uh, people with, with no resources, but I've seen them cleaning the streets and... Yeah, when, when these things start, uh, I, I think everybody noticed or heard that the, the police left everything, uh, you know, and, and the thing started to get like a chaos and uh, even some of the prisoners came out and I, I heard from my relatives that people were so scared and they were staying at home scared trying to you know for getting out and uh, the young were protecting the uh, their uh, their apartment they were staying that down the down in front of each apartment trying to to protect it from uh, those criminals who got out uh, people were getting together they were helping each other in uh, different ways. I, I heard that there is some doctors just came out just to help when they heard that there is some people who fell down during this thing and uh, they opened like uh, a small hostel in the field and everyone was helping even they don't have any kind of resources but they were everybody was trying to help each other to to get this thing to to get to, to succeed, just uh, it, it is really very emotional just to to hear what these people were doing in the street of Egypt. I never felt that I can see this happening in Egypt in my life. I I left in Egypt. Uh, I left Egypt. Uh, I, I of course I was born and raised in Egypt till I finished my uh, college degree there. And when I came here to the United States, but uh, I still have some kind of connection there. My my family still live there, and I go visit them. So I I heard a lot of things was going on in Egypt, and everybody was so frustrated. Everybody get out of of college, and they don't, don't they don't find jobs. They you know people who are get who are get, getting rich are getting richer, and people who are poor getting poorer, and and it, it's it's this thing just get people to explode and, and uh, you know I, I, I'm really proud of uh, all this young uh, youth Egyptian who got this kind of peaceful re revolution uh, to start and get it to finish it successfully you know I I want to tell you I just want to fill in there uh, one day I think it was uh, Wednesday when I called my sister in Egypt and she was crying. She's 75 years old woman living by herself. And uh, I asked why she, she was so unsafe. The police has gone out. There's no police anymore. And they released all these prisoners. And many people from each building went down with sticks, with uh, uh, whatever tools they have to, to protect whoever living in, in the building. So uh, my sister, she kept crying, and then I called the, uh, some relative went to spend the night with her. And I think that reflected in many Egyptian families. Mm -hmm. Yeah, But I, I really want to get to you, and Sarah, on uh, in the role of uh, social media on I, this uprising. No, I think it's really important that you bring that up, um, kind of just relating back to what you were saying before about yeah. how people were very fearful to leave their apartment buildings. Right. Um, on Friday, the 28th of January, where Mubarak cut off the entire 85 million population of right. Egypt yeah. from all internet, all Facebook, all Twitter. And this was a medium that All was mobile phones, too. All mobile phones, yeah. all text messages. I mean, this was a complete shut off. And this was a tool that was being used to mobilize the youth, to mobilize um, the young professionals and get them all in one place so that they knew where to get to, to, to gather and where they should march to Tahrir, um, but in the midst of this uh, cutoff of, of internet, Mubarak also released prisoners. He also got the police out to incite violence against people, and that's when that culture of fear was cultivated in the Egyptian 
population, that's when there was kind of a strife between people that were just, I'm too afraid to go out, I just want this to, to end, and a lot of people were bringing up um, videos where they would show how how poorly the police were treating the protesters, but nobody was able to see that. If you're in Egypt, you can't see those videos online. You can't read those tweets. You don't know who's doing the violence. So you're just saying, I don't want anything to do with it. I'm too scared. That's when people started to come out of their apartment buildings. Young men, uh, older adult males, um, the women would bring the men downstairs tea because, you know, they're staying up 24 hours a day trying to keep the apartment building protected. They provided these great, great neighborhood militias to protect their own their own people. And then once the internet was restored, the videos of the police brutality showed up. The videos of the looting by the thugs hired by Mubarak's regime showed up. And that's when people's fear was completely destroyed. Salma was saying that they were fearless, and that's when they really started to feel this unity of, we know who's inciting this violence, we know who's robbing the streets and who's, in, who's looting, and it's not the protesters. So the, the use of social media changed their perception of fear, and it turned it into a strong sense of courage, unity, and continue to uh, to you know proceed in their protests. But I have to say that this was definitely an e-revolution. This is something that um, the, the youth, uh, the April 6th youth came together and, and created. Of course, the April 6th youth movement was, um, uh, it was kind of a, pr a support group by the, the youth to you know halt all activities on April 6th of, I think, 2008. Um, but this was you know one group that was already mobilized and they already had their ties together. And then coupled with the group of the Khalid Said protesters who were in support of the blogger that was killed over the summer. So these two groups that were both on Facebook, they were both on Twitter, they both had online uh, presence, they came together, mobilized their membership via Facebook and Twitter, and they went out to the streets. And that's what happened on January 25th. Yeah. I'm, I'm really, it's, it's not only the men, I think the women really played an important role. And I, I, I do re see so many pictures where the women were leading. If, if, you, can, if you can fill up on, on, uh, on the role of women in this, uh, and I, I noticed there were no, no uh, harassment of women in the square uh, or throughout the country. There were no uh, robbing or stealing or people taking other people's property. So if you, if you could uh, uh, tell us about the role of women in this uprising. Yeah, I, 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 it was amazing to me to see the observations that you point out, which was that many times women were the ones that were on the loudspeaker, you know, yeah. leading the chants. And, you know, men and women together were there, you know, for a common purpose. There was no distinction between the men and the women. The women were there for the same purpose that the men were there. And really, this was about Egyptian people. It wasn't about men and it wasn't about women. It was about everybody. And um, we really saw that with everybody, you know, being together, working together. Um, and, you know, like Sarah had mentioned, you know, the, it was just amazing to see, you know, the civility and the people, you know, the lost and found, people setting up lost and found, turning in money. These are people who need money. And, you know, they had so much, you know, pride in their people, men and women that they were turning in everything, money, anything that they found, they were turning it in because they were there for a common purpose. Um, and it was it was amazing to see that the, the unity, like Sarah mentioned, um, among the people, and it really was something for the people, everybody. Um, more recently, we heard about, um, I think, the CBS correspondent, Lara, Lara, Logan. Lara Logan, and um, mm -hmm. it was a very unfortunate story um, mm -hmm. that, you know, she had been, you know, sexually assaulted by, you know, certain um, certain Egyptian men after Mubarak had stepped down, and um, it's very it's very sad that something like that happened. But I think it's also very important to know that, that something like that can't overshadow everything else that you know happened. The 18 days of the peaceful protest of the people working together, of the men and women side by side, being Egyptian people and working for one common purpose. I mean out of 80 million people, you know, the majority really were behind this movement. And, you know, as much as that I'm sure there are, you know, internal fighting, you know, people who would agree with different political parties and, and different things like that, 
it was very amazing to see everybody come in for one one common goal, which was to get Mubarak out and the regime out. And it was incredible to see that amount of unity. It, well, it was, of course, that's, uh, that's true. But also, the religion part was really important. Mm -hmm. What I saw, uh, both Christians and Muslims working together for the same thing. Yeah. I saw Christians surrounding the Muslims mm -hmm. while they're praying to protect them. Mm -hmm. and, and I saw a, a Christian woman who was actually pouring the water for a Muslim to, to do his own wudu mm -hmm. before prayer. And uh, at the same time, I saw the Muslim when they were then uh, surrounded the cathedral on, on January 1st, at the beginning of the new year, to protect him from any attack. So it sounds like the uh, if people who were in citing the... the, the the uh, division between Muslim and Christian was was the regime. It was not the people mm -hmm. themselves. I think yeah. Mubarak wanted to create a divide and conquer tactic, and he used rifts between getting Muslims and Christians separated. Yeah. He used rifts between getting the elder uh, population and the young population separated. I mean, he used a lot of rifts to try to divide the population up so that instead of thinking about a unified cause against him, they would think about their own clashes internally. And I think they, the, most, the, the Egyptian population mostly did um, exactly the opposite of that. Yeah. They said anytime there would be maybe uh, religious chanting from either Christian or Muslim side, they would say, uh, you know, a chant in Arabic that says, Muslim, Christian, we're all one Egyptian. So mm -hmm. that was kind of the show that no matter who tried to bring up any religious context, they would be shot down immediately. I mean, not literally, but they would be, they would be over, um, they, their voice would be overshadowed uh, by the strong majority, I mean, very, very strong majority of people that were completely against that. This is, just like Salma said, one Egyptian united cause. Yeah. That, that's true. I, I grew up in Egypt, of course. Uh, I went through high school and university, and even finished my master's degree in Egypt. And I always had Christian friends, so when they tell me there is division between, I couldn't understand where it's coming from. Because I had so many Christian friends, and we played together, we went to the movies together. We, I mean, there were, there were no difference. And, and so many people didn't know whether one person's Christian or Muslim, because we were just all Egyptians. So um, now, now, now that we, uh, we have uh, arrived to this stage, now Mubarak is gone. But there is still this, this uneasiness of people of the existing government. If you can fill us on, on why, why people are so unhappy with the existing government. I think still people do not trust what's, what's, what's going to happen after this revolution. What's, you know, after uh, Mubarak. Uh, Mubarak is, they said Mubarak is gone, but what we heard that Mubarak is still there, is just staying in Sharm el Sheikh. And uh, his cabinet, or the uh, prime minister that uh, Mubarak appoint, uh, appointed Ahmed Shafi as a prime minister, he's still there. He still so I think that the the the, the uh, Egyptian is still do not trust the uh, trust the the government right now. The the there's still some kind of confusion about what's going to happen and. Uh, of course, because people just uh, suffer for so long, they are afraid uh, that you know this thing is is is, is going to continue. If we're going to continue with the same uh, with the same people, they said that uh, Omar Suleiman is still there, Ahmed Shafi is still there, and uh, Mubarak is still there. And we heard from time to time that they are trying th this uh, uh, Mubarak regime, they, I think they are trying to get people to get confused about what's, what, what, what's, what's, uh, what is going to happen. And you notice that there are some uh, protests still, some company now they are protesting uh, to get, you know, to get raised in, in their salary. They think, of, of course, after what they heard that uh, the uh, how much Mubarak, uh, you know, his 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 wealth, how much Mubarak and his family, all this thing, all you know, all this corruption, 
uh, that happened during Mubarak regime, I think uh, people still do not trust the uh, trust the, the government right now. And I think the best thing uh, just to start to uh, uh, to 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 try to get quickly to to solve all this problem and get Egypt to uh, to go on the right path. Sarah, if you can, uh, if you can fill us on the, uh, what do we do to help Egypt in this stage? I mean, this 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 revolution is going to change the whole Middle East. But how can we help Egypt? That's a question I think every Egyptian living outside of Egypt has thought about since February 11th. You know, we've allowed ourselves maybe 24 hours to celebrate, but we saw tons, hundreds of nonprofit organizations across the U.S. alone coming about saying, let's see what we can do to help Egypt. How can we assist? What can we do? And I think there are several things that can be done. I think what we need to do before that is look at what the Egyptians in Egypt are doing and how can we supplement their work and how can we supplement what's being done on ground. The Egyptian people are extremely intellectual. We you see Nobel Prize winners coming out of there, Nobel laureates. I mean, these are very, very smart people. They just were trapped under a very oppressive regime that didn't allow them to vocalize and organize and mobilize the programs that they would like to see in their country. They have huge dreams. They're very ambitious. They have great ideas. We need to see what we can do to supplement those visions because we're seeing tons and tons of, of groups coming about, but we want to make sure that we're all supporting what the Egyptians in Egypt want to do. Um, but some of the things that have kind of noted themselves out from um, what the Egyptians want and also how the Egyptian Americans can help is first and foremost tourism. Egypt strives on its tourism sector. It is almost half of their income as a nation. And after the protests began, the U.S. pulled out all of its tourists from Egypt and said, anybody that's there and has been living there, just, you know, you need to get out. Uh, and a lot of countries uh, across the globe have done that as well. So the first and foremost is tourism. We need to reinstate those tourists, um, the tourism sa uh, sector, and make sure that it's thriving again. Because I don't think any of us are going to be able to live a revolution again. So this is a great time to visit Egypt. So financially, let's help rebuild Egypt by visiting, by taking cruises. And of course, it's probably very affordable at this point. So that's my first suggestion. And I think the whole country in Egypt, of, of the whole population of Egypt has really emphasized that. And the second one is to assist in educating the Egyptian people for what a true democracy looks like. What are political parties? What are campaigns? Who can run? What, um, what do I need to do to run? How do I reach out to voters? How do I register to vote? I mean, these are very simple things, but they've been so, they've been behind red tape and lacked a lot of transparency in Egypt. So we want to help educate the Egyptian people in Egypt, but also make it extremely transparent and easy for anybody who maybe didn't attend an educational seminar or whatever it may be to make sure that they have the opportunity to see those things. And those are the first two things that we would like to see at least done and, and the Egyptians in Egypt have made it very clear that that's what they would like to. I want to ask Selma on, uh, on the, our government in the United States has been helping all this different government in the Middle East. Uh, now there is a, a new movement of democracy. Mm -hmm. How does our government in the United States uh, should consider its, its new approach for the Middle East? That's a really good question. You know, we've seen, um, you know, America um, always talk about democratic ideals. Um, but then, of course, for the last 30 years, they've supported a dictator, something that's obviously anti-democratic. Um, I think moving forward, it's very important for the government of America to, you know, really stand by their ideals as opposed to standing by people, certain, you know, certain people, because, you know, they have fears of, the, you know, who's going to you know, step into power now. Now that there's a power vacuum, is it going to be the Muslim Brotherhood? You know, is that going to, you know, you know, create room for radical, 
Muslims or, or you know basically there's this fear of the unknown at this point point. Um, and I think that for a long time stability was more important truly than you know standing behind democratic ideals and so we saw the discourse um, not you know not really supporting what the true ideals were um, so I think at this point if you know America says they support democracy then they should support democracy everywhere and if the people of Egypt um, as Sarah mentioned that was one of their demands they want democracy they want free and fair elections if that's what they want then they really you know we have to stand by that and we have to support their right to be you know live a democratic society and if they you know choose to elect people through a democratic process that perhaps we don't necessarily agree with well that's democracy and I think that that's something we just have to step aside and, and really let them have those free and fair elections and choose who they want to have represent them that's democracy yeah. there is a uh I noticed recently in Egypt that uh, a lot of companies, a lot of workers just been protesting and a lot of the uh, uh, government people just really crying for people to get back to work because uh, of course if, if uh, the economy will stay at standstill situation, there's no way we can pay anybody anything. So if you can fill us how, how people feel on the on uh, getting the economy to go again? I think, yeah, the best thing just to get the economy to go back again, I think the, to, for those people who are protesting, just to go back to, to work and try to live like a normal life. So if, because if we close all the, uh, the uh, companies that producing like uh, sugar, like uh, uh, wheat, whatever that you know. Uh, after a while, we're not gonna find food for the for for the uh, Egyptian. In uh, you know, so they gonna start to complain that they have a shortage of food. So I think uh, we cannot like push a button just to get you know these people just expect just uh, or some of them just expect just you're gonna push a button after Mubarak left that we we they kind of get, get the raise and get get uh, or, you know uh, good salaries and all this thing i think we have to be settled first and so we can correct all this thing and then we can start a new beginning and uh, so hopefully that uh, people understand that and i think people need some kind of education as sarah said you know we have a lot of people who are illiterate in, in Egypt and 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 this is yeah just is, uh, something that we need to do mm -hmm. and you know even people who are educated there I mean truly since the time of the pharaohs there hasn't been a democracy in Egypt and there haven't been free and fair elections so even if the people know that's what they want they might not necessarily know what that even means or you know what it takes to get that so you know as as far as you know educating or helping to educate you know the Egyptians there um, you know there's a program a group that we're, we want to start um, basically creating short videos and things like that that we can disseminate in Egypt um, basically stating you know those very simple ideas that, that Sarah was mentioning even just what voting means, how to vote, where to vote, you know, how to pick from different candidates, what due process means, what, you know, separation of powers means, those kinds of concepts that maybe, you know, they know that they want some kind of, you know, vague end, but they don't necessarily know exactly what that is because they've never had it before. Well, I want to I wanna thank you, all of you. You really made a very nice discussion today. I want to I want to thank all the audience also for being with us. And uh, uh, if there is any questions, we have the website. Please contact us, and we'll answer any question you want. Thank you very much.